Hello everyone, you are watching Tips on How to Understand the Bible and a reading of Matthew 5. So the first thing you might notice is the text in this video is bigger. Uh, the last video someone told me that the text wasn't big enough, you had to expand the screen and you had to have on YouTube the highest quality setting, which I don't want to force people to have to do that. So I've made the text bigger, hopefully you can see it very clearly. Um, and it does make it a little bit harder for me to read, uh, sometimes, but, uh, it should be, it should work out fine. So first of all, tips on how to understand the Bible. My first point is know the language. Now you might think that I'm talking about, uh, learn the original language that the Bible was written in or the original languages. And that is one thing you could do, but that's not my only point. That would actually be getting ahead of me. Uh, pick a good Bible. This is one of the easiest things you can do to understand what the Bible is saying. Pick a Bible you can understand. If you don't know uh, Old English, then don't, or if you don't understand Old English, I, see, I should say, then uh, pick a version that you can understand. If you are, um, if you speak German, if that's your first language, you probably would want a German Bible. If you um, speak English, you probably want a modern English Bible. Pick a Bible that lets you see what the Bible says. By this I mean uh, pick, I suggest you pick a uh, literal translation of the Bible. Paraphrased versions are okay, um, but in my opinion they're too much like commentaries, and instead of reading a commentary as your Bible, you should be reading the Bible when you're reading the Bible, not a commentary. So if you want to read a, your Bible and a commentary, that's perfectly fine. But you should at least have you should at least have the Bible. It doesn't make any sense to me to uh, only have a commentary. Um, and um, literal translations are closer to they translate word for word usually, or that's the idea at least. They translate word for word from, uh, for example, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, is um, the copies that we have today are written in Greek, and they translate it from Greek into English. Um, and so the question is, how do they translate it? Well, paraphrased versions usually translate it, they call it thought for thought, where literal translations try to translate it word for word. Um, and like I said, I, I believe that thought for thought translations ends up being more like a commentary than like uh, scripture. So pick a Bible that lets you see what the Bible says. So if, if, if uh, you want to understand the Bible, I suggest a literal translation that you can understand. Um, and I suggest uh, the NIV is one that's in uh, modern English and it's a literal translation. Uh, the ESV and the WEB, which is a public domain um, modernized version of the ASV. The ASV is what I use for my Bible study videos, um, except it is in Old English, so it's a little bit harder to understand. So I would suggest, like I said, the NIV, the ESV, and the WEB are two that I know of that are literal literal translations and in modern English. Realize that you're reading a translation, maybe even a translation of a translation, or a translation of a translation of dot dot dot. Remember that Jesus wasn't really called Jesus, and that Jesus didn't say, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but consider the beam, but don't consider the beam that is in your own eye. He said this, and was called Jesus, but in another, but in another language, not in English. So, for example, Jesus wasn't really called Jesus. In the Greek text, the way that the New Testament was written, it's not actually, it doesn't say Jesus, it says Jesus, which is the Greek version of Jesus. But if um, Jesus, or say his mother, say Mary, if Mary spoke Hebrew, when she called Jesus, she wouldn't, even say, she wouldn't say Jesus or Jesus, she would say Yeshua. So Yeshua was translate was transliterated, not translated, transliterated into Greek as 
Iesus, and Iesus was transliterated into English as Jesus. So, the people who were speaking in real life in ancient times, they didn't say Jesus. And Jesus did not actually say this. He said something like this, or very close to this, except it wasn't in English, so he didn't say these exact words. So, um, if you have the King James Version and it says it one way, and then you see the ESV and it says it another way, it's not that the ESV got it wrong and the King James Version got it right, or the opposite, that the ESV got it right and the King James Version got it wrong. He didn't really say that. Both of them are just translations. He didn't say that. He said it in uh, whatever language he was speaking at the time. So that will help you understand what it's saying. And sometimes you can actually see. Sometimes uh, the text seems strange, uh, the way that it says things. And sometimes, especially with literal translations, sometimes that actually is because um, that's the way that it says it in uh, the original language that it was written in. So in Greek, it might say it a certain way, and then they translate that into English, and it sounds a little strange, but one benefit of that is you can actually kind of pick up um, how the, the language it was written in uh, kind of works. Like, for example, Hebrew. In Hebrew, they said and a lot. So they might say, and seeing the multitudes, he went up onto the, onto the mountain. When he had sat down, his disciples came to him, or and when he had sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, dot, dot, dot. So there's and here, and here, and and here. And and at the beginning, a lot of times it seems, at the beginning of every new thought, or like the like a continuation of a thought, at, at the beginning of every uh, sentence, almost. In the New Testament, the writers properly translated what some of the speakers said in Aramaic into Greek. And your Bible translates the Greek into English. So, Jesus might have spoken in Aramaic at some points uh, when he was speaking. It might, Or he might have been speaking in Greek. Some people don't believe that, that he spoke in Greek, but I think I do. So, if he was speaking in Aramaic, say, on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, here... Blessed are the poor in spirit. If that was in Aramaic, then that means that when Matthew wrote Matthew chapter 5, when he quoted what Jesus said, he translated Jesus' words from Aramaic into Greek. But your Bible translates Matthew's Greek into English. So that means that there is actually, there in certain points of Scripture, there might be two. Um, there might be two translations going on that you know you might not realize otherwise. So that's it's not imperative that you even know that, but um, it might help at times. You might be surprised. Just realizing that um, might surprise you what you will what that will help you with. So, and then of course the last point is learn Hebrew and or Greek, which will help you a lot. It takes a lot of time, um, and it can take a lot of money because you have to buy books, um, you have to pay for the class, but it's it's still worth it. If you're willing to do it, and you are able to do it, and you want to do it, then it's worth it. So, the second point is know the culture. And the only thing I have to say about that is there are many good books that can help you to understand the cultures that people lived in throughout the Bible. I suggest Manners and Customs of Bible Lands by Fred H. White for a better understanding of ancient Jewish culture. Um, there are a lot of books out there like Manners and Customs of Bible Lands. Uh, I suggest this book because I've used it a decent amount. I've looked through it. I've read stuff. Um, it's got a lot of different information about just everyday stuff. Um, I mean, it doesn't have everything in there, but it's organized in a way so that you can easily look it up by category. Um, it's, it's just a good book. So, And then there's other books, I'm sure, that you could find if you look that will be very useful for understanding the culture, different cultures. Think clearly would be my third point in understanding the Bible. In order to think clearly, I suggest you ask questions, good questions. Um... I would say that you should ask questions probably after you read it. So you might read a chapter, 
and then sit down and think about what you read and ask questions depending on what you read. Um, and example questions would be, like for example, who wrote this? And the verse that that goes with in my example would be Acts chapter 1 verses 1 through 3. Acts chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 was, Acts was written by Luke. But if you don't know who it was written by, that might uh, influence how you take it. Like, for example, some people, uh, Hebrews, people think that Hebrews was written by one person. Some people think it was written by Paul. Um, some people think it was written by other people. I can't remember all of the different ideas about it, but um, but it'll influence how you take things. So sometimes it is good to know who wrote what you're reading. Why was this written? This is probably even more important. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was waste and void, and darkness, uh, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. Why was that written? That's an interesting question. You might not be very definite with that. Another example is, who said this? I just gave John chapter 9 because there's a lot of pronouns that are used in that chapter. Uh, so sometimes it's confusing who's saying what, who's speaking to who, because it just says, he said to him. Well, who's that? Especially when you just jump into a chapter, you don't even start at a you know a stopping point, like at the end of a paragraph, uh, where it kind of like introduces what's going on, then it's very easy to not even know, you know, to misunderstand who's speaking to who. Why, why was this said? Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. How is this related to other parts of scripture? This um, is something that you would a lot of times want to ask about uh, things like um, theological questions. Like uh, one verse says one thing, and then uh, another verse seems to say something different. So then you're like, okay, does scripture contradict itself? Or is there something else here that I'm missing? And this is a question that you would ask. How is this related to other parts of scripture? And so then you might go looking all over the Bible for similar verses that say similar things to try and figure out how it's related. How is it connected? And then another question, which is very similar but different, is how should this be taken in light of other parts of scripture? So this would be more like... Uh, this is just kind of relating it, um, looking, seeing the similarities between uh, different scripture that are similar, but uh, maybe a little bit different, finding the similarities between different parts of scripture. And this would be more trying to um, figure out what it means. And you look at one verse that says one thing and look at another verse that says another thing, and you try and compare them and try and come to a conclusion based off of what they both say.